We come now to 1 Peter 1, 13 to 16, and we'll just focus probably on verse 13 in this session and deal with a few principles of interpretation like watching out for key, this key word, therefore, and uh, wider connections in the book when we look at how the therefore relates to set your hope fully, therefore set your hope fully, and we we go over here to 315 where it talks about giving a reason for the hope that is in you, so looking for wider connections. And a third thing we'll focus on is participles, like preparing and being sober-minded. How do you think about participles like that in relationship to a main verb, set your hope fully, and then some really profound personal implications of the relationship between the mind and the heart as it hopes. So, Father, as we tackle these kinds of things here in verse 13, I pray that you would show them to us really as they are in the text, so that we can learn these ways of looking at your book and then apply them elsewhere as well as here in order to see the riches of your truth. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, since it is written, you should be holy, for I am holy. So here in verse 13, Just limit ourselves to that for a moment. What's the main verb, the main assertion? And the answer is, set your hope fully. So there's the command, hope fully. Have hope, have full hope in the grace or on the grace that is coming to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Christ. And this word, therefore, is the key connector. Something has gone before. And because of that, he now says, therefore, hope. Therefore, hope. So we back up to these verses and just see a few of the reasons for why he says, therefore, hope. The God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to his great mercy, has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance, imperishable, undefiled, unfading, and it is being kept by God for you. And by God's power, you are being guarded for it. It's being kept for you. You're being kept or guarded for it through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Next paragraph. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, if necessary, God decides when it's necessary for you to be grieved by various trials Why would it ever be necessary for God's child to be grieved by various trials? Answer, so that the genuineness, the tested genuineness of your faith may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So, grace is coming to us at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So when we are crowned with glory and honor, it's not because we deserve it. It's all grace when it comes. Therefore, for all those reasons we saw in 1, 3 through, what do we look at? 7. Therefore, hope. You've seen reasons to hope. Now hope. And so 
always watch for the therefores because that's the foundation of the command here. He doesn't just out of the blue say, have lots of hope, have full hope. He gives reasons and sends us back to them to see them. Now, the second thing I said we'd look at is wider connections with this hopefully over to 3.15. What does it say in 3.15? Be prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks for a reason for the hope that is in you. Do it with gentleness and respect. I think sometimes we stumble over this verse and we think, oh my goodness, I have to prove to everybody's rational capacities that Jesus arose from the dead or prove that the Bible is the infallible word of God. I doubt that that's what he has in mind here first. I think he means, I've given you in this letter, and especially back in chapter 1, verses 3 through 7, I've given you a half a dozen glorious reasons for why your hope is in Christ, why you have hope. God is a God of great mercy. God caused you to be born again. God gave you a living hope. God raised Jesus from the dead. God gave you an inheritance. It is imperishable, undefiled, unfading. God is keeping this for you. God is guarding you for it. Salvation is coming to you at the last time. And in the meantime, every necessary trial in your life is being governed by a sovereign God so that the genuineness of your faith will bring praise and glory and honor. Be ready, be ready to say that to somebody when they say, why are you hopeful as a Christian in these dark days? So, therefore, gives you the reasons as you look back to see wherefore. And when you look for wider connections, you see, be ready to give an answer. And that is, that is the answer. And the third thing I said we'd look at is these, these participles, preparing, being. Now notice, therefore, he could have just gone, therefore, set your hope, right? Therefore, set your hope fully. Therefore, set your hope fully. But instead, he inserts these participles. Therefore, preparing your minds for action. Therefore, being sober-minded, hopefully. Now, what's the relationship or the function of these participles to the main verb? This happens regularly in the New Testament, that main verbs, main assertions, like set your hope fully, are modified by participles, which tell us something about the main verb. What do these tell us? Well, notice what they are. This, this comes from an image of girding up the loins of your mind. So, this is a paraphrase, preparing your minds for action. So, this would be... Um, Thinking energetically and being sober minded, that would be thinking clearly, right? If you're if you're drunk, which is the opposite of sober, you can't think clearly. Everything's a haze and a muddle. And if your minds aren't prepared for action, then you're lazy and you're not energetic. So he's saying, gear up your minds for action, gear up your minds for clarity, and do what? Use your minds to hope fully. Preparing your minds, hope fully. Being sober-minded, hope fully. How would you do that? How does the mind do that? Well, it goes back here to all these reasons. It's the mind. When, when When we look at these Um, verses here and we circle those in yellow and we call them to mind and we think about them and these reasons of how the trials have come to us we circle them when we think about them we're doing precisely what this says we are making our minds get energetically in gear so that we can feed our hope with the truth of the promises behind this therefore here. And clarity is being called for here. So, the last thing I said we would focus on is 
personal uh, insight and relevance to our lives. What, what does this imply about our emotional capacities here? Hope is an emotion, isn't it? Hope is an emotion. So if we're to take our minds, put them in action with clarity in order to serve our hope, we're being taught that the mind serves the heart, the affections, the emotions, biblical, see if I can fit it in here, biblical thinking serves passionate hoping. We need to get this. So put your mind, put your mind into the service of your hope. Put your thinking into the service of your feeling. That's the insight into our personal lives.